Hello and welcome to Global News Today, bringing you exclusive insights and fresh perspectives from leading experts and influential decision makers every weekday here on Al Arabiya News. I'm Tom Burgess Watson, coming up on today's program. Israel urges citizens in dozens of areas in southern Lebanon, including in the city of Nabatieh, to head north. This as airstrikes continue on Beirut. Hezbollah says it has detonated a bomb against Israeli troops attempting to enter the town of Marun al-Ras in southern Lebanon. And Iran's president says he does not want war, but he warns against any Israeli attacks and says it will be met with, and I quote, an unconventional response, which includes targeting Israeli infrastructure. Welcome to you. Now, since Israel's invasion of Lebanon began earlier on this week, the Israeli Defense Forces Arabic spokesperson has warned residents in dozens of places to evacuate. Well, in a new update, the IDF is urging citizens in more than 25 areas, including the city of Nabatir, to head north. Well, in southern Lebanon, Hezbollah fighters and Israeli forces are exchanging fire uh, following the stalling of a ground incursion after eight Israeli soldiers were killed in an ambush. Well, for more on this, I'm joined now by General Nimrod Sheffer, a distinguished former fighter pilot who served as the head of the planning directorate for the IDF. Uh, now, following on from your esteemed military career, General, you transitioned to the defense industry. You served as the CEO and president of the Israel uh, Aerospace Industries. Thank you very much indeed for taking the time to speak to us. I'd like to start by asking about those 180 missiles that were fired uh, at Israel by Iran on Tuesday. Um, Israel is weighing up a response. Do you think it's fair to say it's more of a question of when, not if, and also a question of how Israel hits back? How do you see things moving forward? First of all, I don't like the, the word response uh, or retaliate. I think that Israel should take initiative. And what we saw during the last month in Lebanon mainly uh, suggests that Israel took initiative. And if I can uh, say it, and I think it's it's clear that Iran attacked Israel as a retaliation for the last Israeli attack on uh, the Dahia quarter in uh, Beirut. So I think that Israel should take initiative and strike Iran really hard this time in order to say the following, Iran, we can hit you hard, way harder than you can hit us. And just to make it clear, we just eliminated Hamas as a military power. It's not anymore military organization, just some terrorists that can harm us, but very lightly. And Hezbollah in the north, which was the main military tool in the hands of Iran, was hurt so badly that I think it's not incapable, but but uh, way weaker than it was. So I think Israel will attack in Iran. Definitely, it's a matter of when. And how, I don't really know, but I think it should, it should take uh, military assets and also strategic assets of Iran. I don't think it should aim any civilians or civilian property or anything like that, but definitely military capacities like air defense or so, that would, what I would do. Uh, and more than that, some strategic targets and really the, the I think the strategy should aim to stop that war and say to the Iranian Supreme Leader, that's enough. Uh, there are some red lines, aren't there, that were drawn up by the United States. They said none of Iran's nuclear facilities. Um, do you think Israel will respect those red lines laid out by the United States? I hope so. And I think, yes, and for me, it doesn't make any sense to, to try and attack uh, nuclear assets. Definitely, it's not only in Israel, an Israeli issue, it's a global issue. And the way to deal with that is a, a United States-led coalition. Uh, and, I, and I believe that Israel would not act uh, against the United States uh, clear requests and uh, and against the United States strategy in the Middle East, definitely prior to elections. And I believe Israel will respect that. Um, just going back to Tuesday night's uh, Iranian attacks on Israel, more than 180 missiles were fired in total. Um, fragments of those weapons are being collected uh, across the country. And I'm just wondering, uh, 
why they do that, and I'm, I'm guessing it, so they can analyse what types of weapons were used. Does anything strike you from what we know at this stage about anything significant with regards to the weapons that were used by Iran on Tuesday night? No. As much as I know, of course, I'm not sitting in the, uh, in the deepest rooms, but uh, as much as I know, and I know some, uh, there wasn't any any surprising weapon. They, the Iranians were talking about hypersonic missiles. I don't think they have any. Uh, they have ballistic missiles, several kinds of, uh, with uh, large warheads, like uh, half a ton or maybe more, 70, uh, 750 kilos probably, but nothing that surprised us. And when you look at the results of the defense systems, um, the aero system mainly, you you can tell that uh, the success was such a big success that uh, I don't see any any real change in what we thought or believed they had. How much of a difference did the U.S. and U.K. assistance on Tuesday night help Israel when it comes to averting much more serious damage? Because if I'm not mistaken, almost all of those 180 missiles were shot down. Some. Uh, we understand, intercepted by uh, Israel's allies. Just tell us a little bit about the role and the importance of the role played by uh, those allies. Yeah, there's a big difference between the role of the United States and the, uh, and the role of the UK. Uh, the UK, actually, they already announced it. They sent a couple of, uh, of fighter uh, aircrafts that didn't really do much because there weren't any drones or UAVs sent by the Iranians. Uh, all the attack was done by uh, ballistic missiles, but the United States support was very, very uh, important and meaningful. The United States uh, helped in uh, intercepting some of the missiles, uh, which was a very uh, great help. And there's also parts of of the regional players that took part in, in that attack, and I cannot elaborate on that. Uh, but it's not only the US and the UK, it's a, it's a multinational effort and the region is very, very meaningful in supporting the state of Israel and others because, you know, when Iran uh, launched missile, it can easily hit uh, Jordan, for example. Uh, so the region participated in a very good way uh, supporting that effort, the defense effort, which was very successful. Actually, very few missiles hit the ground. And I don't think that any major damage was caused, and only one casualty in Jericho. One casualty in Jericho. But I think uh, after all, it was a very well. The attack failed. Uh, very successful defense play. The attack really failed completely. Doesn't that depend on what the objectives of the attack were? And we've had analysts saying it was a, a show of defiance, if you will, uh, some sort of a, a, a show of force uh, put on by uh, Iran on Tuesday night for a domestic audience. Um, yeah. Do you think they actually, knowing that you've got David Sling, the Iron Dome, the Arrow uh, systems in place, uh, and, and yet there were, I believe, two casualties, you mentioned them, I think they were injured by shrapnel. I mean, it doesn't sound like Iran perhaps even intended to cause uh, any meaningful damage. Yeah. What's your assessment? Well, my assessment is very clear about this question. On the night of 13th, 14th of uh, April, definitely it was just a show of force. They sent about 300 and some articles, uh, drones, UAVs, cruise missiles, and ballistic missiles, but they didn't really try to harm Israel, just to show that they, they are not hesitating to directly attack Israel. This time, it was very different. They launched almost 200 ballistic missiles almost simultaneously. And that is uh, what they thought will be the right method to defeat the defense systems. And they failed in that. So the, the fact that they launched so many missiles and only ballistic missiles and almost simultaneously uh, proves that they meant to cause damage and they, they did not launch it uh, on 200 different targets but relatively on few targets, meaning they try to be very accurate at some, some assets, military assets mainly, uh, and they failed. So I think my analysis is very clear. It was not a show of force. It was an attack that was aimed to cause uh, harm to Israel, 
uh, very meaningful harm uh, and fail completely. And I think that if you look at the balance of power between Israel and Iran, you can see probably we will be all, all able to see after the, the Israeli attack, again, it's only a matter of time as I see it, uh, the damage that will be caused in, in Iran. And there is almost no way for them to, to prevent it. General Shefer, for the benefit of our viewers who don't know very much, perhaps, about the technicalities of your defence systems, just tell us in very simple terms how uh, the Iron Dome and David Sling actually work. Well, in simple words, oh, that's a mission. I'm not sure I can fulfil. Anyway, the Israel defence system is, uh, is a multi-layer defence system, active defence system, meaning by, by using the term active defence system, uh, I mean that it contains several layers of, uh, of different missiles that aim to hit the ballistic missile on its cruise to, uh, towards uh, Israel. And multi-layer means that we have different types of uh, defense systems that could hit uh, the ballistic missile uh, very far from Israel. And if we fail, we can try again a little bit closer, if we fail, we can try a little bit closer, and then the Iron Dome is the last, uh, the last layer that could hit in very low level, very uh, rapidly. And the defense system is also the system that uh, sends the alert to the civilians to go back to shelters and, uh, and to defend themselves. So this is a combination of early warning, active defense, and, uh, and shelters, a combination of of those three methods, uh, really, uh, it, it's not a foolproof, never it's a foolproof, but it decreases the odds that people will get hurt dramatically. And we saw very, very few casualties and, and wounded people. Um, General Shever, in the past, I, I know you've spoken out and criticised in no uncertain terms the Prime Minister of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu. Um, how many people would you say amongst your former and current uh, military uh, colleagues, I mean, colleagues who are still in the military, share those concerns, do you think, about the direction in which mm. Netanyahu has taken Israel? Well, I, I will give you the easier uh, answer because I don't know the answer to your question, but uh, about 70%, between two thirds to 70% of the Israeli population uh, do not have any confidence in the Israeli government. So this is the answer to your question. And the reason I lost confidence in Benjamin Netanyahu was that he's responsible for the most devastating failure of the state of Israel since its inauguration in 48. Uh, after so many years in position, in power, Israel failed so dramatically. Uh, so uh, any leader that, that faces this reality should say, OK, I cannot serve anymore as a leader. So this is first. And second, I think that Benjamin Netanyahu leads Israel through the last year uh, in, in such a poor way. He doesn't have any strategy. Uh, he doesn't aim to end the war. He doesn't say what type of, of end state he wants to see to the war, not in the south, not in the north. So it's, that, that's my criticism about it. It's nothing to have with character or anything like that. But just those two factors, uh, the, the great failure of October 7th and the poor way he leads Israel. And there is more. His, his very extreme government is causing a lot of damage to the state of Israel. But I leave it aside for a second. Uh, this, is, this is why I'm so uh, critical about uh, Netanyahu. Yeah, I mean, he's taken on uh, a battle uh, on so many fronts, Lebanon, Gaza, Yemen, Syria. I mean, do you think having a, a battle on so many fronts is sustainable? And can he achieve, do you think, what he's trying to achieve, if indeed we know what he's trying to achieve? Yeah, the answer is no, it's not sustainable. But what Netanyahu tries to achieve, as I see it, according to his actions, is just sustain power. Any leader who would see the future of Israel as the most important thing he deals with would say, OK, this is my strategy to end the war as soon as I can, to defeat my enemies as soon as I can, to bring back the deported people in the north as soon as I can, 
to eliminate Hezbollah and Hamas as soon as they can, uh, to prove, to make whatever I can to make sure that Iran doesn't enter the game as soon as I can, just to remind you, and Yahweh is responsible not only to October 7th, but he's the first leader in the history of Israel who suffered direct attack from Iran twice. So it, it, there's nothing that I can say to his favor, um, not, not because I dislike him or anything like that. It, it's not that, just the, the, the situation he brought Israel into is the most dangerous since 1948. So there's nothing good to say about that. And it's not sustainable, no. We, we, should, we should make a stop to that. Yeah, I mean, is, the Israeli army's had casualties already uh, in its incursions in southern Lebanon. And a lot of military analysts yeah. told us that you know, Hezbollah did have the upper hand when it, come to, when it came to what was happening on the ground in southern Lebanon. I mean, not surprisingly, it's where they're from. It's where they've got traps. It's where they've got weapon stores. So do you think it was a mistake from a strategic and a military point of view to go into Lebanon on, on the ground on the part of the Israeli army? Uh, for itself, I don't think it's a mistake. You cannot judge a military action uh, without the context. And I think that if this operation is part of the grand strategy of the state of Israel, it's okay. Uh, without a strategy, I'm not sure. The current goal of the ground forces is to try and destroy the infrastructure that Hezbollah uh, built along the border. All along the borders, uh, uh, there are uh, posts and command posts and launching pads and uh, ammunition stores, like a lot of, uh, of assets that Hezbollah built during the years. And I think that the mission is a good mission to destroy it. Whatever you cannot destroy uh, with airstrikes to destroy from, from the ground. Uh, but I ask myself, okay, what is the what is the goal of that? So when is it going to end? And what is the end state? What should be, what could be count, could be count as a victory of the ground forces? And I'm not sure because I didn't hear none of the leaders uh, relating to that. So I think that ground operation could be good and could be bad, but you have to put it in context and to say, okay, where does it lead to? Uh, I'm not sure I, we have the answer for that. I didn't hear it from the Israeli government. And this is my last question to you. I mean, we're talking about where we see things heading to from, from here. I mean, more broadly uh, and more specifically with regards to Iran. Um, Israel is, you say, going to respond. Iran says it will then respond in kind, although we did hear uh, the Iranian president saying he doesn't want a war. I don't know what we read into that. Do, mm. Does that sound like someone who thinks they couldn't win a war, or does that sound like someone who genuinely doesn't have the appetite for a war? But in any case, do you see it as an inevitability at this stage that uh, your country is going to go into an all-out war with Iran? Well, I think we can avoid that. I think that the Israeli uh, attack in Iran is inevitable. I think that that's going to happen anyway. Uh, but I believe that uh, if the United States mainly, but the international community will send the right messages to Iran, saying nobody wants a war, not even the Israelis, but they had to uh, strike after 200 missiles were launched from Iran to, uh, to Tel Aviv. Uh, I think that if the right messages will be sent and the Israeli attack will be containable, maybe it's the right term. Uh, I think we can avoid uh, an all-out war. It's, nobody wants it, and I think we can avoid it. Uh, as I understand the balance of powers, uh, Israel could cause to Iran uh, way, uh, way harder damage than Iran could cause to Israel. But anyways, I said not because I think it's the right uh, way to go through. I think it's the wrong way to go through. Uh, but if that happens, uh, that would be the case. OK, well, we're going to leave it there. Thank you very much indeed for taking the time to speak to Al Arabiya News. General Nimrod Sheffer, thank you very much. Thank you. My next guest was appointed Lebanon's Minister of Economy and Trade three years ago, amidst the country's most severe economic crisis in living memory. 
or as economy minister, he's been trying to stabilise Lebanon's economy, tackle inflation and negotiate reforms with international organisations in the hope that it will secure much needed financial aid for the country. So where does this latest situation leave an already severely bruised Lebanese economy? Well, I mean, Salam joins us now. I mean, thank you very much indeed for taking the time to speak to us on Al Arabiya News. Um, just tell us, first of all, how ordinary Lebanese citizens are surviving each day. Are there, for example, empty shelves in the shops? Are people managing to find enough to eat? We are, uh, Beirut particularly, is a city under fire since last night. Uh, the conditions are really, the only way you can describe them is that it is, it is a nation in crisis. We have over 1,200,000 displaced people. Uh, a majority of those are Lebanese. There's a big number as well of Syrians that are uh, 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 in the city of Beirut and Mount Lebanon as well. Uh, I mean, the conditions are dire. Um, the day-to-day the, the -day life is, is very challenging due to the security concerns, due to the displaced people. Uh, and uh, as, as, as I said earlier in one of the interviews, uh, you know, it's an unprecedented number of displaced people in less than five days. To have a million people displaced in less than five days in a sit small city like Beirut, is you can imagine how, how stressful that can be on the, on, on the social level, on the economic level, and on the day-to-day -day life. However, having said that, I can... I can um, assure for you that uh, we have uh, uh, worked around the clock, particularly the Ministry of Economy and Trade, to secure the entry of all the needed or all, all the needed uh, food, uh, 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 you know, products, all the needed day-to-day, uh, -day, uh, you know, materials that are used by the people. Yes, people are rushing to supermarkets to buy quantities to store with the fear that something might, the situation might escalate, uh, that they might lose access to those products. But I have uh, announced yesterday uh, through our uh, emergency committee that we have food for uh, four to five months uh, stocked in Lebanon because we already uh, took those uh, measures uh, two years ago, given that we have been living in an emergency mode for over three to four years now. So. Uh, as far as food security, we, we, we are good. No one is having uh, any problems finding food despite the high demand. Uh, we have received a lot of aid as well on the medical side. Uh, we have received a lot of aid on the shelter uh, needs, including bedding and, and other items. That's, that's reassuring. Uh, but let's not forget that before uh, is, uh, Lebanon found itself in the situation it's in right now, 50% of the population uh, had been plunged below the poverty line. Presumably that number is now going to rise. I, I want to ask you, um, before the Israeli airstrikes began, before troops began their ground operation, I mean, if we put the clock back a couple of months, was the Lebanese economy showing some signs of of emerging from what's been a number of years of, of dire crisis? Well, thank you for, 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 for pointing that out because, yes, I mean, I, I say it with a heavy heart. Um, early 2023 was a, a period where we started really working on, uh, we stabilized the, the, the exchange rate of the Lebanese lira, uh, stopped, uh, you know, did, did much control over the inflation effects on the Lebanese lira and the market. Uh, we had an excellent, excellent tourism season. We were booming on the agricultural side, uh, opening up doors to new markets. All that was gone when the war started, unfortunately. We were expecting growth in, you know, between 2 to 2.5% early 2024. That as well uh, uh, was an expectation that was unfortunately uh, not accomplished due to the war, let alone the effect of everything happened on the GDP. We were looking at 50% unemployment before the war. Today, we are looking at numbers way beyond that. I'm even scared to talk about the real numbers we have today on unemployment, particularly with about a million people, including probably 40% or 50% of those people 
are uh, uh, the working force in the south and the Bekaa and parts of Beirut. So it is devastating. It is very difficult and it doesn't look good. That's why we're doing everything possible today uh, to be able to get a ceasefire, uh, you know, pull each other, pull, pull this country together and try to bring back the economy and the social situation to a better place. Because any extension or any uh, uh, further prolonging this war will take us to a very, very difficult place to come back from. Yeah, I mean, international institutions like the IMF have asked uh, of your country reforms in order to unlock urgently needed assistance. But under these current conditions, uh, it's pretty unrealistic, isn't it, to think about implementing reform? Well, unfortunately, I totally agree with you. I mean, uh, before the war, we already had uh, the political tensions in Lebanon and the political, uh, you know, parties in Lebanon uh, not helping a lot make the reforms uh, pass through. I mean, we as a government sent all the laws to the parliament to be ratified, and then they went into the political turmoil between the different political parties. Uh, and, and those reform and recovery laws were supposed to get us to a final deal with the IMF. So now today we are a country without a president. We are a country with a full-blown war. It's going to be difficult to pull this together. Mm. I mean, uh, uh, the parliament is not getting together to elect the president. I don't think they will get together to do any reforms. And that is, that is very destructive to the country, to the future, to the hope we had for a better economy. However, we will keep pushing, but most importantly now, we need a ceasefire, we need a little bit of stability and, and, and uh, uh, quiet in the country to be able to get back to the economy. Because uh, with what's going on now, our priority is helping the people, standing by the people, and uh, try to uh, transition through this unfortunate war. Minister, we haven't got much time, but I want to ask you about something that was said to uh, CNN's Christian Amanpour by uh, your colleague, the Foreign Minister of Lebanon, Abdullah Bouhabib, who said that just before he was killed, Hassan Nasrallah had agreed to a 21-day ceasefire. I'm just wondering whether you heard the same thing. And as an extension of that question, I'd like to ask you, what went through your mind when you got the news of Hassan Nasrallah's death? Well, you know, I mean, this was uh, the tipping point of the escalation uh, because this took the war into a completely different level. Before uh, the, uh, the assassination of, of, of Hassan Nasrallah, we were uh, seriously uh, working as a government with all the political parties involved, uh, including Hezbollah, who's a member of the government, uh, and myself as well was pushing on a lot of messages that the economy, the situation cannot bear escalation. So everybody, including Hezbollah, was very well aware that we need to think very patriotically at the moment for Lebanon. We need to be very strategic in our interests in the deal being put together in the region and try to, to let Lebanon avoid what happened. Now we are in the, in, in the eye of the storm between those you know, massive countries I'm talking about Iran, I'm talking about Israel, I'm talking about all the serious players trying to resolve their conflicts on the grounds of Lebanon. So uh, what we are saying today, and back to your question, yes, the, uh, our Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, uh, was, was right when he said everybody, including Hezbollah, wanted to get to a ceasefire and was trying to do those rules of engagement, think to the dot to try to avoid any escalation. But this is long gone now. We are, we are at a different place now. We are thinking now of a retaliation uh, uh, from Israel back to Iran and how this is gonna spill over to the region. I think uh, uh, what's happening is very, very dangerous, not just to Lebanon, to the whole region. And we are a small country that's paying a very high price of that struggle. And just to hold you on that point about what went through your mind when you received the news of Nasrallah's death, just tell us very briefly, because I know we're nearly out of time, where were you and what, what did you think when you got that news? Well, I, I, I was, I, was uh, I believe I was uh, in, here in the city of Beirut 
visiting one of the visiting one of the shelters and one of the schools uh, and then the official announcement came out before the the the, the attack happened uh, everybody was in shock because nobody knew including myself what is going to happen right after that the first thing that got to my mind is that there's going to be an unbelievable escalation on all fronts whether it's from the Hezbollah side, whether it's from Iran, whether it's from everybody that, that you know, will retaliate for such an action. However, I mean, we were happy to see that there was a lot of control after the assassination happened, still to avoid going to a full-blown war. Even though it was a serious hit, it was a very massive operation, it shocked all of the country, and particularly uh, uh, Hezbollah, but they still calculated things and still tried to stick <laughs> to, to the rules of engagement, I believe, until today. Minister, this month marks two years since uh, President Michel Aoun uh, left office. You've had no head of state for 24 months now. I mean, do you think an interim president can be installed, uh, you know, on an emergency basis? And would that help the situation? Well, that's part of our uh, struggle as a nation today. You know, we are a country without a head. We are a country without a head of state. And uh, when you are a country without a head of state, you are the most vulnerable, uh, uh, you know, link in the equation. And today in the Middle East, we all know that in the UN, in the UN General Assembly meetings, uh, behind closed doors, there's a deal being put together for the Middle East. And when you are a country without a head of state, you are very vulnerable to get the end of the deal, the far bad end of the deal. That is why we are pushing as well uh, uh, on all political parties in Lebanon, because they can do that very fast, very quick in the interest of the country to uh, do a parliamentary session and elect the president. There are several options uh, uh, that are uh, uh, you know, nominated. And that would help the position of Lebanon. That will help us find a proper seat on the table of negotiations for the next, I wouldn't say few months, probably few weeks on the future of the region. Uh, and that will be a healthy uh, approach for Lebanon. Today, we are completely paralyzed. Uh, we are uh, institutionally uh, you know, paralyzed. And that puts us in a very difficult place to negotiate, to get the country all together, to sit with other heads of state, et cetera, et cetera. So it, it is a major issue, but an interim president, back to your question, I'm sorry, I had to explain all the background and, and the, the important piece, but an interim president now is not possible. I mean, they would need to really do a full-blown you know, uh, agreement, uh, get the parliament together, elect officially a fully recognized constitutional president for, for us to be able to pull the country together at such a difficult moment. I mean, Lebanon's politicians really owe it to the people of Lebanon to come together at a time like this. Well, they've owed it to them for, for several years now to come together and help the country get back on track. I mean, are you saying that you're not seeing really any signs whatsoever of uh, people trying to build bridges, uh, put rifts to one side and act in the best interests of Lebanon rather than in the best interests of sects, groups, clans, uh, whatever you want to call them? Well, as an independent minister, I can tell you, since I don't belong to any political party, I can tell you, unfortunately, you described it way better than, than the way I wanted to describe it. No, they are still after the interest of their sects, their narrow uh, uh, interests, the interest of their parties, each on his own way, how he sees the next Lebanon coming together. Uh, many are, are still thinking of, you know, only uh, uh, getting the best seat on the table and dividing the wealth of the government. So we haven't seen yet this drastic change towards anti-corruption, a better Lebanon, a patriotic thinking, you know, uh, or dreaming of the future of Lebanon. Uh, because if that was there, we would have had a president two years ago. We would have had a president a year ago. We would have had president when this war started. Or more importantly, we should have seized this opportunity 
when the when the war came to Lebanon really big and elected the president you know to, to help the country uh, be stronger be more constitutional and give reassurance to the people and the international community that didn't happen so yes the, we are still not at the serious moment this is my very last question to you um Lebanon has a lot of allies in the world. There's a lot of goodwill towards Lebanon in the world. What is your parting message to Lebanon's allies, to world diplomats, world leaders, to help your country to avert uh, any further disaster? What's your message? Well, as, as the youngest member of this cabinet uh, and as a patriotic Lebanese that really is looking at, and dreaming of the future of this country, First of all, I would say thank you to the international community. Thank you to all the friends of Lebanon. I, I know you all love Lebanon, and we all love whoever is today extending the, 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 the arm of help to Lebanon. Uh, we know, and you know, that this country deserves uh, better, and we can do better, and we can make it a very beautiful uh, spot on the Mediterranean again. It can be a haven for investment, and, and beautiful things. So we will uh, uh, put all our faith in our friends and in, in all the countries supporting Lebanon today to help us get out of this critical situation because we know very well that Lebanon was always influenced and was always aided by uh, our international friends uh, who can make a big difference. Uh, we are working internally uh, to get to that place and we hope you will be next to us in the next, you know, few critical weeks and months to solve this issue. OK, thank you so much. I mean, Salam, Lebanon's Minister for Economy and Trade. Thank you for talking to us. Thank you. Well, I'm joined now by the former head of the Israel Defense Forces Operations Directorate, retired Major General Israel Ziv, um, who's been at the forefront of many key operations for Israel's security. Thank you for taking the time to speak to us, General. Um, Monday will, of Thank course, you, mark the uh, first anniversary of the 7th of October Hamas attacks. Uh, you were in Israel at that time. And as soon as you heard news of the attacks. It's reported that you took immediate action. You armed yourself with a nine millimeter pistol. Just tell us uh, what you did on that day. Well, like every Saturday, I was uh, doing my biking. But uh, once I've heard, like uh, anybody else in Israel, that something is very wrong happening down there in uh, next to Gaza. Uh, and I saw the video, you know, coming from uh, the town of uh, Shderot. Uh, I rushed back home, took my uniform, my pistol, and, and went immediately down to uh, to the area of Gaza. I, I was there at around 10 o'clock that morning, and actually from that moment on, I was I was there for the next uh, day and few days. Uh, Look, it looked like uh, the, the invasion of uh, Russia to Ukraine. <laughs> it was really terrible. A lot of uh, burnt cars, uh, bodies. Uh, I had to navigate uh, along uh, that uh, road. Uh, and, and, you know, was engaging several times uh, the Nukba terrorists themselves. Uh, and been able to to be in some key places uh, to help uh, evacuate people from from the that uh, whole uh, attack terrible attack that we had that day and here we are general uh, almost a year later israelis this week once again had to take shelter in uh, in the face of those uh, missile attacks from iran uh, there were deadly knife and gun attacks as well in israel in in urban areas What's your opinion about how we break the cycle of violence? And I'd also like to ask for your prediction on how Israel is going to respond to what Iran uh, did on Tuesday. Actually, if, if you look at it, you, you know that it's, it's all Iran-made. All those uh, proxies, uh, the, the Hamas became uh, part of uh, Iran uh, arm. Uh, the Hezbollah uh, was and still is the, the, the main arm for uh, Iran to, uh, to, to aim and to, uh, to threat Israel. Uh, 
uh, the same is, is, is all around, you know, they, they do build at this time a, a huge militia in Syria. Uh, they do similar thing, by the way, in Iraq on the border of Jordan, uh, aiming to, to dismantle uh, uh, the government in Jordan, the king in uh, Jordan, and goes all the way down to, to Yemen. Uh, this is part of, uh, of, of their strategy, uh, which is against Israel, but, you know, mainly against Israel as a position of, of America, of the West. And uh, apparently their doct doctrine is, is, is breaking down, mainly now by Israel. Uh, the Hamas is, is no longer there as a, as a military uh, terror uh, uh, army. Uh, it was dismantled uh, completely. There are still terrorists there in Gaza, but they are not functioning as an organization. Uh, Hezbollah uh, got a serious blow by, by, by Israel, uh, and, and we continue uh, trying to, to break down their uh, command and control uh, system and uh, to push them away from, uh, from our border. And they apparently, Iran, probably seeing that uh, they cannot uh, impact Israel from, from the proxies, they are trying to do it directly. Now we have a challenge, and I think it's, it's together with the U.S., because uh, that declaration of war, by, by hitting us for the second time, uh, it's against the, the warning of the United States, not only Israel. And I think we have a, a specific uh, moment or window to have a, a bigger look, you know, if, if we just, you know, retaliate or, or give them kind of a blow, which Israel can, can do, or to go even further, because maybe it's time to, to see if we can change the whole uh, uh, excess of, of Iran in the Middle East and do something much bigger with the United States, uh, not just by, by ourselves. Yeah, I mean, there must be a lot of uh, concern in, in Iran as to what happens next, not, not just, not least from the people of Iran, who are quite mixed in their opinions about the direction their country is being taken in by the leadership, uh, but also amongst the leaders who've been infiltrated. There are moles. Israeli intelligence has uh, been on a roll the last couple of weeks. And uh, uh, are, are you saying basically that given uh, the, the intelligence coups that Israel has had in recent weeks, this is not the right moment to be talking about ceasefires. It's the moment to carry on uh, in the same vein. Is that what you're saying? I'm saying that eventually, in the end, we need we need a ceasefire. We, we cannot, uh, you know, be in, in a war for for so long time. But now, as we are, we are now forced to 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 face directly Iran, it was not by you know our invitation. I think maybe maybe which we are already in a war. It's maybe time to do something more meaningful because I think I'm afraid that if if we a ceasefire now, uh, it means that they would be able to, to recover quite soon, both the, the, the Hezbollah and, and, and in Iran. And I think we should, uh, we should go further more in order to make sure that the, the, the whole region become more uh, uh, stable or more peaceful for the next decade uh, and, and not to wait. What should be the, 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 the right uh, goal or the right target? It's a, it's a question. Maybe to go on the leadership. Uh, you know, in the end of the day, the, the leadership of Iran, yeah, they may have the title of, of you know, uh, uh, president, the big leader, etc., etc. But in the end of the day, it's a, it's a, it's a country, it's a state of terror. <laughs> they are the one to, to mess the Middle East and to, 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 to you know, destabilize the world. So I think that uh, uh, it's one of the conversations that we have now uh, in closed doors with the Americans. Uh, we don't have to retaliate immediately, thanks to a very efficient defense system uh, that prevented any serious you know, damage or loss of life, mainly. Uh, but I think it's, it's, it's the right time to, to go for something even bigger, yes. You've suggested in the past that uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu's priority is perhaps his own survival. 
uh, and that uh, prolonging the war uh, in Gaza, for example, and now expanding the conflict to, to other countries uh, would therefore appear to be more in his interest than in Israel's uh, best interests. Uh, do you still hold that opinion? Look, we, we, we need to be more precise. Yes, there, there are political issues. I mean, there's no doubt. I still, I still think like that. On the other hand, uh, uh, Hezbollah, for example, we did not declare war on Hezbollah. Hezbollah was the one, Nasrallah, uh, his place now is with God. Uh, he was the one to, to open a war on Israel on, on October 8. Uh, and, and, and as a part of Iranian doctrine, and he declared that. And, and Iran was the one, you know, to go twice uh, twice on Israel. Uh, maybe they didn't like the idea of, uh, you know, decapitating Ania, but in the end of the day, he, he was part of the enemies uh, that, that uh, was launching the, that aggressive attack uh, on Israel. So with Netanyahu or without Netanyahu, I think we need to deal with our enemies. Putting that aside, yeah, Netanyahu has uh, his own consideration, political consideration. And, and, and for example, I suggested, and I'm saying that uh, out loud uh, here in Israel, you know, on every stage, that we should have wrapped up the, the, the front in Gaza uh, and bring back the, the hostages and go only now on Hezbollah in Iran. Uh, but but it's, a, it's a war that was forced on Israel, and, and this is something else than Netanyahu. We, we have to, to, to deal with it. Yeah, indeed. You described the, the situation in Gaza as being, and I quote you here, a dire quagmire. And a lot of the analysts and a lot of your former colleagues we've been speaking to are saying something quite similar here, which is that Prime Minister Netanyahu is showing that Israel's got tactics, but there isn't a strategy, there isn't an end game. Isn't it extremely dangerous, not just for your country, but for the entire region, that the man calling the shots in Israel doesn't have a strategy? First of all, you know, when, when in a war, sometimes you know when you start, and even if you have a doctrine or a strategy, you don't really know where it ends. So let, let's be fair on that. And, and it was proven, I think, almost all history. Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, yes, I, I still criticize the, the aspect that there is no clear strategy. It's more tactical than strategy. Uh, and, and we should uh, aspire to a very clear goals, uh, which are not clear. And, and the issue of Netanyahu, well, to be honest, yes, he, he is not alone. Uh, there is all the security echelon. There is the Minister of Defense, uh, Mr. Gallant, which I trust very much, uh, the Chief of Staff, and, and uh, other people in that level, which I, which I trust. And I think they know what they are doing. And, and right now, what, what they do is, is, is purely military. What we don't have well is, is the political aspect which should, you know, turn the, the, the military achievement into a substantial political uh, goals or achievement. And this is still, uh, I think, uh, lagging behind. And, uh, yeah, Netanyahu... Uh, no, he, he, he's doing, by the way, I think that, that some of his decisions uh, uh, are OK. But leading that to, to kind of a safe shore that will enable Israel to go back and to, you know, some, to some stability, uh, I have my, my question marks as well. So how Israel uh, responds to uh, what happened on Tuesday, uh, those missile attacks on your country will determine very much, won't it, whether or not we are on the precipice of an all-out war between Israel uh, and Iran. I mean, where do you see things going to from here? Look, uh, we, we all, uh, especially, you know, the, the ones with the experience, uh, we are all uh, uh, peace lovers and not uh, war lovers, and, uh, because we know what war is. Uh, on, on the other hand, it's, it's a point which we, we need to face reality. And, and I think that, you know, uh, Iran, small step from a nuclear uh, capability, 
And uh, the, the amount of proxies around Israel is such that uh, once we start to break that uh, blockade and, and facilitation of, of uh, uh, militaries all around us, uh, and once we are already in it, I think we need a couple of more weeks in order to, to, to achieve more militarily, but mainly to, to know where we are up to politically in, in the area. And, and here I think that the discussions with the Americans, although it's not a bet, a best uh, time for them uh, during the, the election time, but still I think that they understand that it's also an opportunity to, to reduce tremendously the Iran threat, which is not just on the region, it's, it's all over. And uh, on, on the issue of Iran, uh, I would advise to go very, you know, uh, from the from the belly and and to be spontaneous. Uh, but if they ask my advice, I would I would rather to go much higher than what people would think, you know, just to punish them and close it down. I think that Iran it's 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 a big problem for the whole world, and I suggest, by the way, it's it's not just for the Americans to join us. It has to be uh, uh, something much bigger than that, maybe to change to change the regime over there. It sounds like it sounds like question. it sounds like that's what Netanyahu's got in mind, doesn't it? Because he said on on Monday he recorded a a message to the Iranian people and he said change is likely to come sooner than people might think. I mean, it sounds like either this is a sort of a psychological uh, tactic he's using here, saying, well, we've managed to track down and uh, kill Hassan Nasrallah and, and, uh, and, and therefore send the message that perhaps uh, someone else might be next. Or it, it sounds like he's, he's, he's got something in mind that uh, you know, really could bring about uh, a change of, of, of governance and, and the regime there in, in uh, Iran. What's your interpretation? Yeah, but, but let's be honest. Going there, it's, it's a little bit uh, above uh, the, the pay grade of even Netanyahu. It's, it's something that, that the, Americans should, uh, the Americans should lead. Uh, and, and, and yes, I, I think that Israel is, is, is talking that direction. But I, I don't think that we will go uh, so far only by ourselves without the Americans. And I don't think the Americans will give us a green light to go so far without them. So I think it's more a question, you know, going to Washington, to the White House, than, than to Jerusalem, to Netanyahu. Can you remember a time when the region was this unstable? <laughs> no. <laughs> it's really, uh, really a uh, mess going on around us, I agree. Uh, you know, on, on the other hand, when, when somebody is opposing that on you uh, and you are managing it, I think even, even us, we, we are surprised, you know, because in our doctrine or, or strategy, you know, basic strategy, national strategy, we are not ready for such a long uh, operations on, on one hand. And, and on the other hand, you know, to go simultaneously on all the fronts, different fronts. Uh, on the other hand, we need, we need to say that in the last 10 years, even more, uh, Israel was preparing for such a war. By the way, you know, not many people know, yeah, but the, the, the Aero, air defense missile, which was used to dismantle the ballistic uh, missiles that came from Iran, were we're starting on the 80s, I think at the time of, uh, of uh, Prime Minister Rabin. Uh, he signed that uh, agreement to develop them in 88. That was the beginning, you know, of something 36 years ago. So uh, Israel uh, has uh, the technology in its arsenal, you know, to, to fight and, and, and to do a very serious impact very far away from here. Uh, but did we expect that scenario to happen? The answer is no, and I don't remember such a, a times from all my uh, military history. Yeah, and I mean, when, when we're no closer to achieving a peaceful outcome, if we talk about the fact that, you know, 
the death toll in Lebanon alone is now reckoned to be about uh, 2,000, and that's just from a, a few days of, of, of airstrikes and, and the ground invasion. Um, I mean, it, it might be said that intelligence looks like being Israel's greatest asset at this particular moment. I don't know if you agree with that. And that, therefore, it would be most uh, sensible for Israel to focus on the intelligence aspect of things rather than uh, more military campaigns in which civilians are going to get hurt uh, and killed. And it's going to just fuel that cycle of violence uh, from which there doesn't seem to be any way out. What, what are your thoughts on that? Your final thoughts, because that's my last question. Look. Uh, uh, in Lebanon, I, I agree that uh, Israel should not uh, go for a, a full offense and, and take over uh, of South Lebanon. And, and what they are doing now, it's, it's mostly raids on, on uh, close uh, contact uh, infrastructure that uh, Hezbollah prepared for similar attack that we, we met on the south. Uh, from the Hamas. Uh, it was kind of a copy-paste that the Hamas took from Hezbollah, but uh, Sinwar was jumping first, you know, without anybody to know, even his partner. So so going to those uh, close areas and, and, and destroy that infrastructure, th this is a must. This is a defensive uh, act. Uh, but as far as I understand now, and this is a, also my, my view and recommendation, it, it's not about taking over or invasion to Lebanon. Uh, and I hope that that, uh, that kind of escalation will not take place. Definitely, also in Lebanon, there is a chance to, to, to change uh, uh, and maybe to bring uh, Lebanon back to the Lebanese. And maybe it's time for the Lebanese army to, to deploy it in the south and take the place of Hezbollah and kick Hezbollah out, or to the north, or wherever. Maybe, maybe by the way, to call them to recruit to the Lebanese army. But for that, they need the, the assistance of, of the European. Uh, France, for example, can be very uh, important in, in that respect. The US, of course. Uh, the British, if they are there, uh, willing to, to, to support. And, and that would be, it's not for Israel, by the way. It's for Lebanon. So, yes, I think we should aspire to, to see a, a kind of a settlement that will bring back to stability, but not before something meaningful is done with Iran. Because, and by the way, maybe with Iran, the, the, the path should be political, because their economic situation is, is, is terrible. And maybe the, this new president uh, has kind of a different approach. And, and maybe now, when they are threatened, uh, it's the right time for them to go to that approach and, and agree on, on, you know, stopping the nuclear program. But, but we need to use that time, not just to cease fire, but to, to have a serious political achievements. Okay, but we're going to leave it there. We really appreciate you taking the time to speak to us. Retired Major General Israel Ziv, thank you. Thank you, Tom. Thank you very much. Well, for more, I'm joined now by General Joseph Votel, a retired four-star U.S. Army general and commander of U.S. Central Command, overseeing military operations uh, right across the globe. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us. It remains to be seen how Israel is going to respond to Tuesday's missile attack by Iran. Um, and you've suggested on U.S. media that we might see something much stronger uh, this time around than what we saw in April. What are Israel's options? Uh, thank you. It's good to be with you. Well, I think uh, Israel has a lot of options. Uh, they can go after a you know a variety of different targets uh, in in Iran or of Iran's interest uh, that are in the region. This could include command and control sites. It could include uh, the launcher sites or other military bases that participate in the operation. It certainly could include the nuclear facilities. Uh, associated with the nuclear weapons program, or it could be uh, infrastructure and uh, energy, you know, energy targets. Uh, you know, for example, grid, uh, grid targets or facilities associated with the with the grid, or perhaps oil and gas facilities with a intent of impacting uh, uh, Iran's uh, economic situation. But they also have a choice in how hard they can go. They can go as they did last time. Uh, with a relatively light 
uh, response, really intending to send more of a message. Uh, or they can go a little bit heavier with the intention of not only sending a message but actually punishing. So there's a lot of there's a lot of options here, and, and I, it is my assessment that given the size of the uh, of the uh, Iranian attack a few days ago, uh, that uh, that Israel will see that it is necessary not only to send a message but actually to uh, you know go after something which Iran values and and make them pay a cost for it. Uh, President Biden has said, of course, uh, the U.S. is fully supportive of Israel, but he did say there were some uh, red lines. Uh, one of them was Iran's nuclear facilities, but you suggested that perhaps that could be uh, a, a likely or possible target uh, for Israel at this stage. Well, uh, I, I think the president has, has said, you know, that he is not in favor of that. I, I don't know that that completely excludes it from uh, Iranian considerations. Ultimately, they will make the they will make the decision on this, and certainly, uh, the United States, as a, as a key partner to uh, to Israel, will be involved in you know appropriate consultations and and discussions about this. But ultimately, the decision is one for Israel to make, not for the United States. Iran has said that it will step up uh, its response if indeed it's attacked by Israel, counterattacked, I should say. Um, Iran's also saying it doesn't want a war. How do we interpret uh, a country that says we don't want war? Does that mean uh, we don't think we could win one? I think that I think that certainly is part of it here. I think I think uh, Iran appreciates that they will not they will not prevail in a toe to toe toe to toe fight with. Uh, with Israel, uh, if 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 it came to that, um, so you know, I, I I think in this latest round, I think that Iran was compelled to uh, to respond to Israel. Uh, I think there was a lot of pressure being put on them by uh, Hezbollah and others uh, within the so-called axis of resistance. Uh, they had not yet responded to anything over the last several weeks. So I think they felt that they were compelled to respond. They did. They did it in a strong manner. I think they did that recognizing that one that Israel would would be well defended and secondly that any action would would invite a counter reaction from uh from from Israel. So I, I think that what uh what is what Iran is counting on is Israel's response to be of the nature that it was the last time that it, there will be a response but it will not be one which will you know uh necessitate Iran to respond and it will provide an opportunity for to de-escalate at least from the current cycle of of, uh, of violence. Um, one of the reports that really struck me the last couple of days uh, suggests that there's a huge amount of paranoia in the corridors of power in Tehran, not least given uh, the intelligence role that Israel seems to be on at the moment. Uh, they infiltrated Hezbollah in a way that I think nobody uh, could have expected. Do you think they've managed to do the same with Iran? Do you think they've got the same level of intelligence and perhaps they've got some surprises in store for Iran? Uh, well, yeah, I, I think I think we've seen them demonstrate some, the Israelis demonstrate some pretty exquisite skills uh, over the last several weeks, so I, I have to make the assumption that they do have have good insight into uh, Iranian decision making, Iranian leadership, and and uh, just what is what is taking place and what might be vulnerable within within all of that. I, I mean, I, I think I think your your comments are exactly right. I mean, this is uh, this is actually a, a resetting of, of some fundamental assumptions that have been made across the region. Uh, Iran has long counted on the fact that Hezbollah could be a deterrent, uh, could be you could be a principal deterrent to um, to Israel, and and that is proving to be false. And now uh, Iran is in a situation where they are now having to reevaluate their assumptions, reevaluate how they establish uh, deterrence against uh, against Israel. And I'm sure this is causing a lot of challenges. And on top of that, you you stack the the uh, unprecedented success. Uh, militarily that uh, that Israel has had now for almost two months. Yeah, it's probably affecting morale on the Iranian, Iranian side as well, isn't it? Oh, certainly. Yeah, I, I mean, absolutely. I mean, this is not only are they losing close partners, but they're actually losing some of their own uh, in uh, in these activities. 
Uh, there's a new president in Iran, Masoud Pazeshkian. Uh, he rules over a divided country. Um, do you think there's scope? And we've heard overtures from Prime Minister Netanyahu earlier this week to the effect that, you know, he was trying to win over hearts and minds there in uh, Iran. Do you think he's, uh, he's on the right tracks there or do you think this is wishful thinking? Well, um, I, I mean, I, I think in general, I think it is a good idea to try to win over hearts and minds of the people. I mean, I, I think it's very well established that uh, there's a large part of the Iranian population that does not care for the current Iranian regime. And I think it's important to distinguish between the two. So trying to get the Iranian people uh, to recognize that the, the the pain that is being inflicted on the region, the pain that's you know potentially going to be inflicted on their country is largely a result of the choices which their government has made uh, for a number of years now is an important aspect in bringing bringing other pressures to this uh, to resolve the situation. You know, there's a lot that be, that can be done militarily, but I think the real skill here is going to be in not only applying, military power, but diplomatic power, informational power, economic power, uh, to really change behavior, uh, the behavior of Iran and its its uh, its proxy network here uh, going forward. And I think that is what uh, Israel is, is very, very focused on doing. We've got a, a dangerous cocktail, though, of, of situation, circumstances uh, in, in this region. You know, we've talked about uh, the paranoia in Iran. We've talked about power vacuums, you know, with Hezbollah essentially being decapitated. Um, we've got a great deal of uncertainty. There's a real risk, isn't there, of a miscalculation at some point. And some of the analysts we've spoken to this week have, have been echoing this. I mean, is that a concern that you, you would share? Oh, yeah, I, I, I absolutely agree with this. I, I mean, the Something something could go wrong here. A response that goes awry, like we've seen, you know, with Hezbollah's strike into the Golan Heights several weeks ago, could could really be a precipitating uh, uh, event here. And so, yeah, this is uh, this is high stakes um, risk management here on on both sides, both for the Iranians and for the Israelis, and of course for the United States as well as the principal partner and uh, uh, to to Israel. So yeah, there there's a lot that could go wrong here. Uh, with this, and uh, uh, so uh, these are not easy decisions. I think it's, I think it's good that Israel seems to be taking a little bit of time to consider uh, their response, uh, and and hopefully that will not only help them develop an effective response, but one that uh, the one that can be well managed, uh, you know, throughout the next the next cycle of wherever this uh, this uh, this current venture takes us. And this is my last question, just, just sort of looking forwards, really. I mean, are you hopeful that we're going to find some sort of a diplomatic resolution to all of this? Or do you think it's an inevitability that there's going to be a lot more violence before we get to the point that uh, peace and ceasefires and the like are discussed? Well, I, I, as a soldier, I always have to be hopeful that there's a, that there's an there's an alternative to fighting uh, forever, and so I, I I do hope that we can we can get there. I you know I don't see immediate indications of this at this particular time. But, you know, one of the roles of military power is to create conditions uh, so that our diplomats can can come to the table here, that we can we can compel people to come to the table. They have to they can make choices uh, other than employ military, continue to employ military power and try to try to resolve these issues. And ultimately, that's what it's going to take. Um, but, you know, that that sometimes takes takes time to get to. And I think that's the situation that we're in right now is that bo both sides uh, and as we've seen in Gaza, I mean, uh, neither of the of the warring parties has seen it in their interest to come to the table yet, and that's probably because there's not has not been enough pressure uh, created that uh, that that would require that. Uh, so yeah, I'm 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 hopeful that we will get to that. I don't see immediate signs of it uh, right now. Okay, well, thank you very much indeed for taking the time to speak to us on Arabia News, General Joseph Votel. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Well, that is all we have time for on Global News Today. Thank you very much indeed for watching. Be sure to join us tomorrow for more exclusive interviews. Until then, goodbye.